This is BNN Bloomberg 1410 AM, 103.5 FM. HD3 Agency Click presents Everything Film with Film Robot from the Shark Club in downtown Vancouver. I'm Joe Leary along with Patrick Shelton of Agency Click. And by the way, you can download these uh, podcasts uh, through Spotify. All the usual places. Under iTunes. Everything yeah. Film. Yep. iHeartRadio has it. Yeah. Check out our YouTube channel. And uh, a big shout out to our production crew who have done a great job. Today has been... Uh, it's been a great job. Yeah. And the crew just keeps growing bigger and bigger. Also, our thanks to Ron Somlin, who came down and took some uh, killer shots of us. Yeah, so Somlin Studios. Could not be more grateful. Look what we got here. It's Tammy Gillis. Tammy Gillis, ladies and gentlemen, how about a hand for Tammy Gillis? <laughs> Tammy well, Gillis, you. uh, literally, you've done it all. But I was before we get into the body of work, I learned that you were discovered by a modeling school while attending the University of Manitoba. That is correct. So prior to the discovery... Mm -hmm. and embarking upon university, what was the original Tammy Gillis game plan? I was going to be a lawyer. Really? Yes. And how did it, was it literally that, that it was just a chance opportunity that led you to open your eyes and go, hey, maybe there's something here? Or were you, what was the enticement initially? Well, doing pre-law in university, I had no idea that it wasn't going to be as interesting as it was on television. Sure. So when I had to spend 16 to 18 hours in the library looking up and researching and finding all these cases, I was like, this is death to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I very quickly was like, well, I, this is not at all what I thought it was. And then I was out with some friends and a girl came up to me and she said she was a modeling agent. She gave me her card and asked if I'd come and have a meeting. And all my friends were like, yeah, right. I ended up going uh, and I ended up signing with them and I didn't really enjoy the modeling but they would send me out for commercials um, and I started booking commercials and it was just so fun like the first commercial I did was for Green Kids and Lyle Lovett was in it and I literally like ate an ice cream cone and walked across a bridge. <laughs> and how old were you at that time? I was in university. Oh really? So, so do, you, like, do you think you were like casted younger like they thought you were younger? Well, I do play a lot younger than yeah, I look. Yeah, do you think that? Okay. A lot of okay. the time. And yeah. it's it's sort of my family, like my little sister. You have that. She has two children, but yeah. she looks like she's the babysitter. I think that's really common. I think but, it's really but, common but, with like a lot of people. Actors. But Tammy, but, getting, anyway. getting back to that point of discovery, I mean, you're embarked on a, a serious profession that, uh, you know, never mind the, the opportunities it presents to you, but obviously you had the, the brain power to be in that capacity why would you just was it what was the attraction that just so easily like sort of turned your mind around and thought okay law is now in the past this is what i'm going to do well in high school we, we were really fortunate from a super small town in manitoba called mccreary there's about 400 people that live is there it now. smaller than clandeboy manitoba I don't know what where so, that so is. So I bet Clan of Boy is smaller. There you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got me on that one? Um, so she, a new drama teacher, English teacher came and she opened a drama club. And so I started doing theater. And that's kind of when I got bitten by the bug. But I'd never met an actor. I never thought that was something, a possibility. Um, like the most famous people we knew were like hockey players and my cousin was a jockey, you know? So like athletes. Uh, and then when I was in university, I started doing the commercials and then I started taking theaters, my electives. And then I started auditioning for jobs because at that time in Winnipeg, the film industry was really small. They had a really great independent film industry like Guy Madden, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was in a short film that he did for the Toronto Film Festival. And uh, I just started sort of falling into it and booking jobs. And that's kind of how it all started. <laughs> and there's been no looking back. There's been no moments of regret. Because like, again, as an actor, as a working actor, you can be rich or you can be poor. You, you can be totally booked up or you can be calling your agent going, anything, anything. Whereas, you know, if you're pursuing the law degree, I mean, perhaps that would be more, you know, substantial in, in the overall scheme of things. But generally speaking, there's been no point in your life where you thought, I wonder what would happen if. Sure. Okay. But the thing is, is uh, there's definitely moments of, will I ever work again? Yeah. And it's just ebb and flow. And the biggest and hardest part of being an actor is managing your mindset. It's that voice in your head that's like you suck you're never gonna work again what are you gonna do how are you gonna pay your mortgage and like also the chatter of people at times being like when are you gonna get a real job 
you've had so many auditions already, nothing's happened. And it's like, you have to believe in yourself more than anyone else in the world. And then it, it literally, at least for me, um, is I can't not do it. I love it. I love it so much. Sure, I could probably do something else, make more money, have more stability, but would I love it as much? Mm -hmm. Definitely. You know, not. you know, you know um, somebody explained it to me once is that for every job, there's like, there's someone else that can do that job. Like somebody could have took any role in, in, in acting, right? But if you're not in that position to try to succeed and not putting yourself there, then you can't, you're never going to get it. And yeah, you're going to get rejected. I mean, that's one of the lessons we keep saying. It's rejection, rejection, rejection. Constant and then rejection. You might, and I, I bet you have some stories where you got something where you didn't think you were gonna and then you fell into it or something happened where it just kind of what? You know, it's funny because there's a lot of actors that are like, oh, I bombed that audition and then they book it. That yeah. has never happened to really? me. Really? Okay. Okay. Never. When I bomb, it's bombed. It's <laughs> gone. But like I all on the flip side of that, I know when I knock it out of the park, especially yeah. like we don't have the luxury of being inside the audition room anymore. It's all self tapes right. kind of in a bubble. But when I'm in the room and I know that I'm hitting it, I like when I leave, I'm like, I booked that job. And I'm always, I'm generally always. How does right. that work? If it, actually, I'm actually curious because that's a, a good talking point is self tapes. So right now, somebody you're auditioning, what do they send you? And they say, just make your own little movie at, at home. Like, how does that work? It's a lot of work. So what happens? So Walk like us through. Walk this us through. year alone so far, I've done under over a hundred self tapes. Okay. How does that work? So you get an email from your agent. They send you the breakdown. They send you sides from the script for you to prepare and then you have to set up your own self-taping studio, light it, have a backdrop, get a reader. And if you can't have a reader in person, have one read via Zoom. Um, and then you tape it, and then you edit it, and then you send it off to your agents, and then you hope that you're going to get that phone call that says you booked it. Wow. But 99% of the time, you just hear nothing, and you move on to the does next it go, one. Does it go to like a second audition ever, like with self-tape, or is it always one? It depends where you are in your career. Yeah. And it depends on the show. It depends on how much time they have. Sometimes, and like a lot since in the last couple of years with COVID, a lot of them are just booking off that one tape. So you can, but I have friends that have taped something and then a month later, they're like, you booked it. And they're like, what did I book? I don't, <laughs> that was so long is there, ago. Is there, is there, um, and uh, just because of a lot of our listeners probably would need to, is there like um, where you just make a tape that's just a general monologue that you send out? Like do you have Generally, a couple of those in your back Nobody pocket? really does monologues anymore. Or Maybe what, if you're reading for a theater production. So it's always some topic that's brought Generally, to you. it's always a scene with at least one other people because when agents, when you apply for an agent, a lot of agents will give you a scene and get you to prepare it and come in and read with them. Okay, okay. Because one of the biggest things with acting is reacting and really listening, actively listening and being present with that other person. So if you have a monologue, it's just kind of you just talk, 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 talk. They can't see if you're really taking in what's being said. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Actress Tammy Gillis is our guest. Everything Film, presented by Film Robot and Agency Click from the Shark Club in downtown Vancouver. Um, you mentioned COVID, and I must ask you, when everything started shutting down and we all realized that, you know, this life has changed dramatically, was there a, oh, shite moment for you where you went, what's, what's going to happen now? Because you saw the film industry seriously affected, as, as every industry was. What was your rationale? What, what did you know or what did you hear? What did you fear? What did you think? Like, what, what was your expectation at the worst of the quarantine period? Well, initially when uh, COVID hit, it, the film industry, I feel like, was one of the first to completely shut down. Um, but that being said, Film industry is all about putting out fires, making decisions and moving forward. I think that we're one of the most resilient industries because we have to constantly change and adapt to whatever is going on. You know, like I've been on sets where we're about to do this crazy action sequence that they've spent like eight hours setting up. We're about to roll. And then one of the grips was like digging a hole to like kind of hold this light and he hit a water pipe. <laughs> And there was water all over the road. They had to get somebody to come and shut it down. But we couldn't shoot because everything we'd shot up yeah. to that point had no water on the road. Oh, my goodness. So it was like, panic, panic. What are we going to do? How are we going to? And they're like, okay, let's just go. Let's just do it while 
some of the road has no nothing, uh, no water. And like also, uh, I I've worked I worked for three seasons on the show Siren, and we were filming one of the finales out in Burnaby, and we'd shot half the scene. It's a big, huge scene, tons of people, lots of background, and it started literally blizzarding. So it wasn't just snow, and like you can get away with rain if it rains on one side of it and not on the other. But it was blizzarding, and there was absolutely no way we could shoot. And they were panicking because it was one of our last days. What are we going to do? And I came up with the brilliant idea of um, putting the sheriff gets hurt in the scene. Spoiler alert. I'm like, put him in the ambulance and let's shoot into the ambulance and put a tarp on top so we don't see any of the snow. We're inside the ambulance. And so they ended up doing that. And by the time we'd kind of finished that piece, it had stopped snowing. Now, I want to ask you about set protocol, because as you walk on the set for the first time, the embarking upon the career, your role is just do what you're there to do, take direction, don't say anything else, you know, don't speak when you're spoken to, basically. But as the resume fills out, and you've done more and more and more, and you've got more and more credibility and more acclaim, do you feel that it is, is within reason to maybe make a recommendation, hey, what if we did this? Or is there that mentality that, no, 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 you're the talent. Uh, let, let, let us direct the, shank, the thing. You just simply act. Or is it kind of open to some degree of collaboration? Does it, pen, does it vary from set to set? Yeah, it really does vary from set to set in sort of the scope of whatever production you're working on. So you definitely run the risk of making a suggestion and them like totally shutting you down. Right. 100%. <laughs> it's like, who are you to be telling yeah. me what to do? Um, but a lot of the times people are very collaborative and that's one of the things I love the most about working in the industry. And especially the longer you're on a project, the more they're willing to hear your ideas because they you form a relationship and they start to trust you. It's like, I kind of was maybe a little out of line. It was the end of our first season and they were kind of like, who's this girl? We're freaking out. Like, but they're freaking out because they're losing so much money. I'm like, it doesn't hurt for me to suggest this. Yeah. The uh, latest project, Riverboat Romance. Riverfront River, Romance. Sorry, Riverfront Romance. I'm sorry. My, no, my writing okay. is bad. Uh, on Super Channel in, in October. Um, it's Hallmarky. It's definitely in that world. It's, it's in, a family-friendly rom-com. Uh, and, and again, I mean, you can't go wrong with the Hallmark formula because there's nothing that's more plays to the bigger crowd than those types of films. So tell us about uh, Riverfront Romance. Yes. Um, well, I also think it's like people, especially now, want to know kind of the end of the story before they get there. They want a happy ending. So that's what those movies are kind of about. So um, I actually am an executive producer on it as well. So that was a really interesting experience um, being the lead and one of the executive producers. But it's about uh, Kara finally gets a book deal and gets enough money to buy her dream home that she's wanted since she was a child. She buys her home, her, she moves her mom in, everything's great. And she wakes up one morning and there's construction going on completely blocking her view of the river and her dream of being this best-selling author, writing her novels while looking at the beautiful view. Uh, so she, of course, runs down and runs into Riley, uh, and uh, trouble ensues. Well, I we don't want to give anything away, no. so that's and good. We're, we're, there's no, no. spoilers. got to tune in. Alert. Yeah. <laughs> But okay. I'm sure there's a happy ending. Let's just leave, leave it at that. There's well, a happy ending. But, it, but it, uh, you know, I, I know that you've covered a variety of genres. Uh, do you, as an actor, accept all challenges? Is there one that you kind of tend to migrate more towards? Or are you open to anything from, from horror to hilarity? Yeah, absolutely. And it's one of the things I've actually made an effort to not have them pigeonhole me. Every time they kind of stick me in a box... And I feel like they're not really seeing me for anything other than that certain thing or that's all I'm booking. I'll do something to change my appearance. So they have no choice but to kind of deal with me as I am. Because I love doing a variety of different things. Like I, would ne I wouldn't want to do the same thing over and over and over and over again. And what I found in the last couple of years is when I did Siren, which led, well, Ghost Wars was kind of the first one, but Ghost Wars was like, I was like an action hero. And it terrified me because I don't really do stunt fighting. I don't know how to shoot guns. I'm like shoving P90 
people around and like big men <laughs> trying and like trying to stop fights. And it's so funny because Kim Coates, who is from Sons of Anarchy, mm-hmm. he's Canadian. Mm-hmm. He's like, Tams, you got to hold me back. I'm like, look at me. How much do you weigh and how yeah. much do I weigh? He's like, you got to get into it. <laughs> um, but that is the kind of stuff that I absolutely love. It's just like Van Helsing is a good example too. I um, had to fight the vampires, right? And I, they gave me this crazy weapon, which we nicknamed a bat shetty. It was a baseball bat with a machete <laughs> drilled into it. And like, it, I had to, I, we did like a three and a half stunt fight sequence right. that we had to shoot full out top to bottom every take because there were three cameras shooting. So inevitably you're in someone's camera. So if you can imagine for 10 hours, Going full out. <laughs> wow! I that was could, a long day. I can I can lift my my arms the next wow. day. I wow. didn't think I was going to make it to the end of the day. <laughs> uh, I must ask you about. It's a very full resume, but there's one that really resonates with me because it was a show I really got into. Uh, Less than kind. Ah, uh, yeah. And nobody was, ever brings that. That up. well, it was it just it won me over. It was just there was a charm to it. There was a warmth to it. And considering it was set in Manitoba which is not warm, and a lot of the scenes weren't. But um, tell me about the experience. Maury Chaikin, the late, great Maury Chaikin, uh, what was that experience like for you? Oh, man. I was so pumped to do that, uh, that role and that audition. And I'm just like, the show's called Less Than Kind. They're not kind to one another. Right. So I took some really big chances in my taping. And what's interesting is that the casting director in Winnipeg told me that I'm the only person, Mark McKinney, who was the showrunner, yeah. Um, has hired Sight Unseen wow. from just my tape. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, I feel a little pressure now going to set. Um, but it was amazing. And I knew a lot of the crew having kind of started out in the independent film world there. But what the, like, the amazing thing was is that um, the creator, Chris Chase Green, and Mark would sit behind the monitors and they'd just yell stuff out at me. Say this, try this, point over there and do that. So it's like you had to like be in this take and just be like rolling with it. And a lot of the really, really good comedy directors, that's what they do. They just make stuff up on the fly and you've just got to kind of go with it. Well, it was, it was charming and the, the body of work speaks for itself. Uh, Tammy Gillis, thank you for joining us. And how can people react to you and and see your stuff on social media? Well, thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Uh, I am on all social media at at real Tammy Gillis. Real Tammy Gillis. Or just at real Tammy Gillis. And I have a website, TammyGillis.com. But I would love for you all to tune in to uh, Riverfront Romance, yes. which premieres on October second. Oh, how exciting! And I will. It is. All, the whole province of Manitoba is going to be tuning in to no watch. No doubt. No <laughs> doubt. Thank you so much for joining us.